Hi everybody, welcome back to the Duma podcast. My next guest is a gentleman named Asif Azuddin. He's a Malaysian researcher and journalist, as well as a friend of mine from back in my time on radio. Asif and I have not spoken for some time now, but suffice to say, I followed his work on LinkedIn on subjects like mental health and public transport. Recently though, he put out a bit of research on Malay youth, which I found to be interesting because, as you know, from an election standpoint, the Malay youth were instrumental in the way the results turned out in the last cycle. Suffice to say as well, they will continue to gain an importance in the years ahead, thanks to the sheer demographics involved. And so, the conclusions that Asif discovered in his research were fascinating, unpredictable, and combustible. I do hope you enjoy consuming the video as I did while I made it. And as always, do please share the video, like to the chat, like the channel, and subscribe if you haven't yet already, as the vast majority of you have not. And so now, dear viewers, without further ado, may I present as if as it is. Asif Azudin, thank you for doing this. Um, we've ob obviously we, we are former colleagues uh, mm -hmm. at BFM, and um, I've always seen you as quite a young, you know, quite smart, um, well-spoken, eloquent young guy. And we haven't dealt with each other for a long time, but I've seen your writings and your, you know, your reports from from afar, uh, with um, traffic um, analysis and obviously your documentary film uh, work and and your articles as well. But what really piqued my interest recently was the fact that you came out with some some studies on Malay youth which obviously, as we know in Malaysia, uh, are the single most, you know, I, I guess most important component in terms of Malaysia's future, both from a political and domestic standpoint. Um, but before I start into that research, perhaps I kind of pass the baton back to you and to introduce yourself and what you do and, you know, kind of like what you've been doing for the last 10 years, lah, Azif. Right. Thank you, Chong, for having me today. So, uh, my name's Azif. I currently, currently right now, I'm a researcher. Uh, and I've been a researcher for the past five to six years. But before that, I was obviously a journalist. Um, that's where we met each other. Uh, but yeah, for the past 10 years, I've been doing documentary journalism. So basically going around Peninsula Malaysia, documenting communities, social histories, localities. But a little bit after that, I decided, you know, what, I want to be a researcher because I wanted to go a bit more in-depth. So basically took my master's, came back, and I took my master's in sociology because natural progression, right? Um, yeah, and ever since I came back, I've been doing policy research, I've been doing data analytics. Uh, but right now, I've kind of gone back into doing sociology uh, academically uh, at North University of Nottingham, yeah. Okay, and uh, let's get into the nuts and bolts of your research. And um, I wanted to talk to you because I, th I think when you posted this on LinkedIn, I was obviously quite piqued by, by, um, by, by what you would discover. And um, you actually had quite a lot of interesting um, conclusions in terms of um, where the youth mentality mindset is among the Malays. And you went to the East Coast, you spent a lot of time there. But it's not just the rural guys, you also spoke to the urban guys. Yes. So, so um, I just, I guess in headline terms, what was the extent of the research? How many people you spoke to? What, what, what were kind of the things that you were looking for? Yeah. Um, and in fact, who funded this, this research? Yeah, so the research is being done with Iman Research. Uh, a think tank that's been around for about 10 years. They mostly do sociological research, uh, basically into faith, community, politics, stuff like that. Um, but with this research specifically, it was really about understanding post G15, why did the Malay youth vote the way they did? What did, the, what did that vote meant, right? And I think many people would kind of like go to saying, okay, they voted because maybe because they support the past. Uh, what are the reasons doing so? But for me, and for us, I think it was really about understanding a larger context as to what were the ideology, right? What were the worldviews? What was influencing the way they voted, the way they did? Because I don't think it was as simple as, okay, we don't like DAP. We don't like Pakatan and what it stands for. I'm just going to put PH, sorry, we're going to vote PN as a protest. Uh, it was not as simple as that, right? So that's what the research kind of like started with. It was about really understanding why the Malay youth voted the way they did. And I think if you see in the previous general elections, the youth vote, uh, the Malay youth vote specifically was quite pivotal in throwing the spot behind Prikata National. And if it wasn't for, I think, how the formation of government was negotiated at the institutional level, it could have been a it could have been a PN government for all we know. And a lot of that would have been attributed then as well to the youth vote. Uh, so really, uh, we interviewed about 115 respondents, uh, but these were also interviews that were done in focus groups. And interviews, I think a lot of people would tend to say, let's do a survey because the survey gives you a broader view of what the general trends are. But Iman Research takes an approach to do things which are more in-depth. Right? We do interviews and through interviews, and I think we know this through experience, 
we tease out a little bit more of of the personal. We tease out a little bit more of the world with the ideology behind long conversations. Uh, so we spend a lot of time in the East Coast, yes, and that would be Terengganu and Kelantan. But we also went to the northern states, which is Kedah Perlis, um, and so Kedah Perlis and Perak uh, and Penang as well. Um, mostly the mainland. Um, and really, the reason why we chose those spaces specifically was because these were also states that we felt had a lot of uh, what we would consider the Malay heartland. So it, so places where uh, AMNO and PAS traditionally would kind of fight it out for votes. Um, and these were the kind of like the areas that we focused on. Of course, there were other parts that we also looked at, which was KL. So in KL was where we kind of met with urban Malays. Uh, people who, during the day, would be white-collar workers, but in the evenings, on the weekends, you know, these are the same people who go clubbing. These are people who go for gigs, for punk, for punk bands and whatnot. So they had another life outside, kind of like their day job. And I think... Um, as with any ethnic group, right? It's not a monolith. But there are multiple identities at play here when we talk about the Malays. We're talking about those who are white-collar workers, those who are working class. Uh, we're also talking about those who are students. We're also talking about those who identify themselves as Islamists. And I think in our research, we found multiple identities of Malays who we spoke to, which I thought was interesting because it, while it complicated the picture, there were several themes that we found which were quite common throughout lah. And I think we can talk about that as well a bit later. Yeah. Well, uh, let's let's get into the yeah. weeds among that. I mean, what were some of the common themes that you yeah. came across? So the major theme for me was that a lot of these youth in the Malay Heartlands felt like they had a lack of agency um, on multiple fronts. So we're talking about lack of agency in terms of wanting to do something for their own communities. Uh, so say, for example, up in Perlis, there was a group of youth who I met who were very passionate about mental health. And this was kind of like off... Uh, coming off COVID, right? The pandemic, where they saw their peers, they saw a lot of their people in the community feeling like um, they weren't, um, they were experiencing a lot of mental health difficulties, but didn't really have access or really the, the language to kind of talk about mental health in a way that us in the clan really, really take for granted. Uh, so they wanted to start out a movement, but being all the way up in Perlis, um, there were a lot of institutional limitations or resource limitations that they had. One was that they couldn't exactly walk up to KKM and ask, hey, can we kind of collaborate? Because, you know, you're working in government, there's a lot of bureaucracy involved, there's a lot of red tape. They go to the state government, the state government will kind of give them a run around and say, hey, you need to register maybe as in as a organization first before we kind of, kind of take you seriously. Um, and that also involves a bit of politics because when it comes to kind of dealing with local level authorities, there's a lot of like, it's a, it's a case of like, you need to know someone in local authority or you need to be part of a political party. So you are either you either needed to be aligned or know someone in AMNO, or you needed to know someone in PAS in order to kind of get access to that sort of resources, that sort of knowledge. So when I went up there, half our conversation, yes, was about the risk study, but the rest of our conversation really was about how do you start a movement? How do you form allyship? How do you uh, register for an NGO? How do you find resources, um, crowdfund, things like that? And this kind of like brought me to think, realize lah, that actually a lot of kind of the excesses that we have in urban, uh, in urban, in the urban west coast, so this kind of the ex- guess will extend from Johor all the way up to Penang, is that we really take for granted the fact that we have access to a lot of these things. Civil society. Um, if you don't, if you don't want to access government, we can access private companies or private organizations who have uh, experience in these things and are willing to kind of offer support. Uh, but this wasn't necessarily true in the uh, in the northern states in the Malay heartlands. So institutional access was challenging for them. So that's one aspect. They were also... Oh, do you have something? Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Um, so what kind of ailments from a mental standpoint were they suffering from? Depression. A uh, lot of anxiety. I think one thing that came out from the uh, pandemic obviously was the sense that the term lost generation really is and can be applied to them. Because lost felt generation. Lost generation. Yeah. Because yeah, this was a period where I think if you think about how... If you think about the ages of 18 to 25, there's a lot of socialization, a lot of kind of like world sensing thing that was going around there, uh, which is disrupted by the pandemic. So they couldn't exactly go to universities because, you know, we didn't want COVID to spread in universities. So they had to go behind their screens. And that really, I think, limited a way how they could, how they can engage with their friends, how they can uh, learn effectively uh, in the classroom. So um, really, there was a sense of alienation. There was also a sense of resentment. I think growing up, um, coming up from that time period, which I think most of us experience. But if you're thinking about youths who see themselves as having maybe 40 to 50 more years into the future, one formative part of their lives has already been disrupted by the pandemic. And then going out of the pandemic into a workforce or at least a labor market, which 
is unfriendly towards them. Um, and this was also one of the gripes that they had. In, in terms of? So, the, the way how I would summarize it, and this yeah. was kind of like, this is me piecing together different narratives, is that the problem that they experience economically um, in the in the north in the Malay heartlands really is that okay so I've gone through and spent quite a bit of money on my degree uh, whether I took up PTPTN most of them took up PTPTN anyway so I'll take up PTPTN to learn uh, to do my degree once I finish my degree I actually want to come back to my hometown let's say it's Kanga I want to come back to Kanga and contribute back to my community right because you know that's where home is I want to contribute make the economy grow make the market more lively there but when I go there when I come back home the job market is very limited. Um, if I wanted to enter into the civil service, it is very gate-capped. So again, a case of you need to know someone who can let you in or kind of like tell you, hey, there's an opening here, I'll make room for you. Or they have to go back to the private market. And the private market in all of this, most of the smaller towns, most of the smaller cities are very limited. Even if they're able to find a job, it won't pay well. So then they are left with the thought, okay, should I go down to the big cities, which is down in Penang Island, or should I go down to Kuala Lumpur? Or maybe I can borrow maybe I can start a business. But starting a business means I need to borrow f- money from friends or family and I have no guarantee whatsoever that my business will do well. So, uh, for, lo- so for a lot of these youths, they feel like they want to contribute back to the community. They want to go back to the hometowns, make the economy grow, make the community bigger, uh, more lively, more successful. But there's a lot of economic blockage there. So in the end, they're left with the one, with the one choice of going down to the bigger cities, Penang or Kuala Lumpur, to find jobs, maybe earn a little bit more money, but cost of living is also high. But in the end, what they see back home is that my hometown is never going to grow big. My hometown is never going to develop. And if, I, if we leave it up to the local authorities or the politicians there, they're not going to develop it at all for their own interests. So yeah. from a generational, generational standpoint, when I was like, you know, obviously 20, 21 years old, mm-hmm. um, the idea was to graduate and then go to a big city and, and get a you know get a fat job, right? obviously, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but what you're saying, what you're suggesting among the Malay heartland is that they're not doing that. They're going back to the to the to the home, you know, th- town, and uh, trying to give back to the community, which in itself is kind of like a, a mindset mindset change. Because my time was like go to the big city, big big bucks, right? W- yeah. Why is that? Why why do they feel the need to go, to go back to the hometown? I think the one thing which COVID has taught us is that remote work can be done anywhere. Mm. Uh, so there is also the question of like if I go back to my hometown, cost of living is lower. I'm also closer to my family, uh, but then there's also this feeling like. Why is the West Coast the only place that can be developed? Why is Penang Island? Why is uh, Johor Bahru? Or why is Kuala Lumpur the only place that can be developed economically? Why can't we do the same uh, or bring back the same energy to, uh, to the Northern Heartlands, to our hometown in Kanga, uh, to maybe Alosata or even Kota Bahru? So there's a lot of, there's a lot of pride, I think, in their, in their own sense of hometown and state that they want to kind of bring back. But of course, economically, uh, the conditions back home make it difficult for that to kind of occur. Yeah. Okay. To further digress into this point, right? Sure. So the economy will be kind of like um, a, a solution, part of the solution, to, solution to the yeah. angst, right? But then do they do they do they do they do they come to the point where they, they ponder the why, right? Why is it that opportunities in their hometowns are limited, and then can, can do they do, do they then triangulate back to the to the to the to the state government or to the party of the government to then understand? Oh, is is it because this party has has kind of like failed us, or or not been able to have the the far sightedness of the policy ability mm. to put that together, or do they not see that? Because the states that you mentioned are, are predominantly um, kind of like conservative led lah in, yep. in some sense, right? So this is where the this is where the reading becomes a bit more complica- complex for me because it's is a little bit of uh, what's the word is a little bit of cognitive dissonance, uh, but there's also an acknowledgement of that. So when I spoke to say youth in Kedah they were very well aware that Sanusi's government was not performing economically. He may have made some moves that are seen as bold uh, and very much different from the, um, his Amnu predecessors. But at the same time, I think, it's, how do I put it this way? They acknowledge that it comes down also to the state government, but at the same time, they also feel powerless to be able to change that in a way. So we, And this kind of boils back to the agency, right? So if you're talking about uh, youth development in their own communities, um, traditionally, during the AMNO days, a lot of that would come from funds coming from KBS. So the Ministry of Youth would kind of like disperse funds to the local levels. Um, maybe sometimes state government has its own pot of money that it does as well. Um, but ultimately, this is kind of like how the youth mov- movements used to grow, right? We're talking about Raka Muda, we're talking about Belia Empat, Empat B. We're talking about smaller movements that kind of crop up 
in all these smaller Malay heartlands. This is also a way how AMNO back then also I think uh, kind of gained their support, right? They give they give resources and funding. Uh, there's also kind of like a patronage thing going on where okay, we remember the good, we remember that you gave us this. So you know, you know what, you care for us, um, and I think that translates a lot to AMNO's politics back then, right? But ever since the 2018 elections and after the Pakatan government kind of changed hands, uh, what I was told was there was one a noticeable reduction in resources given to these local to these local youth movements, um, and that I think made a lot of the work of uh, capacity building very limited or redundant lah. Not redundant, but very limited in these areas that traditionally needed it. So you're talking about simple things like, and this I had the conversation with the AP youth member actually who was in Pera, who said that yeah, we used to get money. Uh, we used to be able to get money that we can kind of disperse even the smallest, simplest things like could come uh, like um, what is the oh my God during Malay during Malay uh, weddings they would play the kompang. So things like as simple as the kompang being given to young boys to perform during weddings or community events, these were things that okay lah, you'll step on the Barisan National logo. But these are things that youths feel like they can have meaning as part of the community lah. So yeah, every every wedding, every community event, we will play uh, we will play the kompang. Uh, that's our way of giving it to the community. So, after the after the transition to the Pakatan Harapan government, and I think in what could be seen as maybe financial restructuring or maybe budgetary priorities, a lot of these funds that used to traditionally go down to youth a lot really uh, dried up or was pushed in other areas. And so I think this is one part of what I'm saying. Like is that so when it comes to wanting to affect political change, they feel like they cannot enter into this sort of leadership or capacity building roles where they can make change. Because a lot of these roles are also gatekept. So you cannot enter into, say, leadership roles or leadership opportunities unless you're part of a political party. So this is whether you're in AMK, um, AMNO, PAS, DAP maybe in some, some areas of, of, uh, of Minan Penang, or if you're part of an Islamist party. Uh, sorry, if you're part of an Islamist organization like ABIM, IKRAM, uh, or ISMA. These are Islamist organizations that have their own large part of money and they have their own capacity program. So the thing, this is why I say youths feel like they are kind of like politically important in a way. And the only way they can express their agency is through votes. And this, I know it will sound contemplative. So why did they vote for PN? If that was the case, if they recognize that as a problem. The vote against PH was, could either be seen as a vote against DAP or could be seen as a protest vote against uh, Pakatan Harapan. So it's not like they, it's not that they trusted Perikata National per se. It's not like they believed in what Perikata National was selling. But it felt like Pakatan Harapan in its two and a half years of deliverance really didn't look like it did a good job. DP is and forever is kind of antagonistic towards the Malays. That sort of mindset, I think, that's kind of seeped in, um, unfortunately. Um so, but then there is also this thing, and I, I like to think of it as kind of like, a, I like to think of it in this sort of a marketplace perspective, right? You're shopping for certain things, you see a brand that you know a lot. Okay, this brand, I know what, Starbucks. I see Starbucks, I know Starbucks, I know what to expect of it. But hey, the prices have gone up, or the coffee is not great anymore, it doesn't taste great. There's this one new shiny coffee brand called Zeus. I've never heard of, uh, this is not an endorsement by the way, <laughs> but I'm just saying it as an example, right? But there's a new coffee brand called Zeus. Branding looks interesting. I don't know how it tastes like. But tell you what, I'm going to try putting down. It's a bit more cheaper. I'm going to put my money into it and see how it tastes like. And I think the, there is a level of sophistication when you think about voting now in that Pakistan, the, the, the 2018 elections proved that we have political choices and we can make political choices. Um, so if I'm, happy, if I'm unhappy with this government, I can change to another one in the next one. So for this use, you know what, let's try Pak- let's try Perikatan National. They may not deliver. They may not they may not be great, right? The promise that they the, the promise that they make might be broken or they might not deliver, but it is something that we do not know. But we were willing to try because we were willing to try in twenty eighteen. We were willing to try again in twenty twenty two to see how it turns out. And if it doesn't turn out, we'll kick them out again. In, in, in GE16. So there is this mindset for these youths that, okay, we have many more years to go. Election cycles every five years. I have how many more elections in me to go and vote differently uh, to see how it changes. So Prikata National was a vo- protest vote against uh, AMNO. It was a protest vote against uh, Pakatan Harapan and what it represented, but also DAP being part of it. Lah. 
Yeah, so it's not that they believe so much in Perikatan National and a lot of them right now do admit or at least do share a lot of like the grievances they have against their PN state governments. But it's also a matter of like, okay, at least we tried. Um, and if it doesn't work out, you know what, next election is going to try. But then, of course, this crosses into a, mul- a more complex picture of how they want to go into leadership positions so that they can change the politics, but they cannot unless they enter the traditional modes of going into politics, which they don't really want. Yeah, so it's it's a complicated picture. Lah. Yeah, yeah. I don't know whether to ask you first about how they think about the Chinese or how they think about politics as a career. Let's talk about politics as a yeah. career. <clears throat> the um, oft-quoted refrain in terms of politics as a career was that um, in the Malay heartland, in the kampongs, when the Malays... I mean, this is what people tell me, like, anecdotally, mm. right? When the politicians come with the cavalcades and their VIPs and the nice watchers and what appears to be wealth, right? You know, it becomes like a, a, a plausible career for them. Because they think that if they enter politics, they can they can make it big, you know, in some sense. Is that still true? No, no. So, so a number, a lot of the youth youth leaders that I met were those that were really passionate about the communities. Uh, so, say in Kedah, they were talking a lot about how there were high numbers of, uh, say, drug users among the youth. How there were high employment among the youth, and they felt like going into politics or at least entering uh, some degree of political affiliation. And this was through Rakamuda, which is linked to Amno. They felt that maybe through Rakamunda, they're able to kind of enact change in their communities and become by becoming political leaders in their communities. So there was no mention of wealth. So maybe it's a subtle thing. Maybe maybe they might have that. But at least in my conversation with them, it felt, it felt like they were genuine about wanting to change the communities. But those were for those who are interested. But I think the majority that I spoke to were highly uninterested in politics because it's seen as, um, I wouldn't say immoral, but... There is, there is political apathy, lah, so to speak. The tide of politics. So one of the things which was happening around the time that we were, uh, that we were interviewing early, in the early parts of this year was the this whole talk about, oh, we're going to have Lanka Dubai, we're going to have Lanka this, this move, this, that move. And this was brought up in our interviews where they were saying, look, we're so tired of seeing politicians kind of argue it out, right? Like this, debating whether or not this, whether or not PN should be in government. We don't want to, you know what, stop talking about wanting to be in power and just focus on policy making or at least being a good opposition. So there was a lot of rebuke as well for Perikata National for not being a good opposition. But there was also a lot of rebuke towards Perikata, Har- towards Perikata Harapan in what they saw as not having a mind set towards policy making, but more towards kind of like uh, fighting with PN lah over the legitimacy of, of being in government. Uh, and this was reflected a lot <coughs> in the state elections. So when I went down to the rallies of Perikata Harapan, <coughs> Almost all the rallies talked about how this is our legitimate. This is how we legitimately became government. They were they were narrating about how you know, or Anwar was uh, meeting with Zayed, and then Muhyiddin was rebuking them in front of the king. So even in political rallies, there was that discussion. I was thinking, and for me, like, I was thinking like, look, this is a state election. Your platform should be policy making, not talking about why you should be government. You already became government. Stop. Telling that story, you know, nobody cares anymore. People just want to know what you do for your communities. But the fact is, you've picked up on that. They felt sickened by it. And for them, it's like, you know what? This is why we don't care about politics. This is why when we see politics and we see people arguing, we don't really want to care about it. We don't care to enter it because we see how it's being conducted by these elderly politicians. And you know what? Why bother? Um, and this is, I need to also kind of say this, that when I did ask them questions about, okay, what about youth, youth more youthful politicians, right? And then, I asked them about Sadiq. Uh, and I'm Sadiq, I'm sorry for hearing this, but no one actually liked Sadiq. They didn't think that he was a genuine, he represented their views genuinely. Um, and he seemed to be more of the, uh, he seemed to be playing more to the tune of what all the politicians expect of the youth, but not what the youth wants. Yeah. What do you think is their view of corruption and, um, you know, obviously politics as as a way of, of, self, of self-monetization, acquisition of wealth and all that. What, what is their view in terms of uh, merits and hard work and discipline? And and I think to go a little bit further beyond that, mm-hmm. what is their view of the privileges? Lah? Because... So, yeah, the privilege question was quite interesting because we didn't ask about that. But it's interesting because when we speak to a lot of these Malay youths, a lot of them... Um, so there's the explicit part of it and there's the part which maybe 
is kind of op- the system operating for them. So these are youths who are able to enter public university, and we know public universities are very privileged towards the Malays. Um, but there were more. There were, apart from the quota aspects, a lot of them felt like they never benefited in any way from the government. So a lot of them say, look, I mean, if the government really want to give us money, we had to take out loans from PTPTN. We are talking about parents who our parents who are poor or parents who don't earn so much. These are parents who never receive a single cent from the government. Whenever we did go to the state to ask for maybe aid and whatnot, we were always turned away or we were never given uh, any sort any form of um, any form of assistance. So I think that it's I think from one perspective, I think from there's a lot of narratives. I think there's a broader narrative among us where we say, okay, the Malays benefit from these privileges and they do in certain ways I think if you think about quotas in universities 100% I think the Malays benefit from that a lot uh, but if you're thinking about the day to day if you're thinking about the everyday politics a lot of these youth feel and I think even in the daily lives feel like they, can't, they don't have access to the sort of privileges what privileges right I want to get a loan my loan is rejected I can't. I go to Mara and Mara gives me tells me that I have to fill a thousand forms and have to feel, I have to kind of like um meet a thousand requirements which I definitely do not fulfill in terms of maybe um, capital, in terms of background and whatnot. So in the end, I'm turned away. I borrow money from my friends. I borrow money from the bank. Um, so for a lot of these youths, the privileges do not extend, I think, to the everyday politics. In its non-explicit way, it only extends maybe to their place in um, yeah, in public universities or for those who have worked, if they're able to enter GLCs. Lah. Yeah. I know this could be a broad generalization, too generalized as a, a comment, but um, mm. do you think that as a whole, they prefer these privileges to stay or do they see the fallacy of it? Do they see the um, the way it's been kind of like confused and, and confused by the one percenters or the elites that get basically obviously uh, are able to really monetize these pr- privileges? Yeah, so it's definitely latter. And I think this is where it becomes a bit muddier. Lah. So for them, so there are a number of youths, in fact, I think most of them that we spoke to lah, do agree that um, the Malay privileges have been abused by the one percent, five percent, the five, whatever lah, the elite Malays. Uh, but then they were saying that if it was done more equitably, such as how the NEP was initially in the sixties or seventies when it was initially in- enacted, if it was done in that manner, if it was done in that spirit, then we wouldn't have the problems that we do have now. So they, so the logic kind of operates on the sense that the NEP was corrupted and kind of take advantage of us by the elites. So in the end, kind of like those on the bottom tier, the M's and the, the, M's and the B's never really caught what was equitable. Lah. So in that sense, they say, but the only people who can change that are the Malay political parties because they are the ones in power. They are the ones with, with the ability to change the constitution, to kind of shape policy. So maybe we need to put better Malays in place. So again, that, help, an that, that, that sense of helplessness lah, because yeah. they can't change the scenario. Yeah, right? they can't change the scenario. Do you get the sense that from a feasibility, political feasibility standpoint, um, the Malay youths would be able to countenance the, the possibility of the NEP being re-examined or even being dismantled? Or, or Dismantled is, I think, too much, mm-hmm. lah, right? But to be re-evaluated and to be, to be oh, massaged, hun- yeah. would, they, would they be amenable to that? 100%. Yeah. I think for now, because, like I said earlier, right? Because so they, they are yeah, aware that it's they somehow are, broken, lah, right? They are certain, yeah. So I think, and I think this is something that Anwar is quite aware of. So when we see how he makes statements that are quite populist, very class four in nature, he's stepping into that, right? He's saying that, oh yeah, the elites, the rich, are the ones who have been taking abuse of the system. I'm talking to you. And he says that. <laughs> and he does, I mean, he doesn't say that in a direct manner. Right? But if you think about how he talks about policies or taxations onto the rich, I mean, uh, Anwar the populist, right? Anwar in his populist, more populist speeches, uh, talking about how oh yeah, we're gonna make quotas more equitable to everyone. Uh, Mara, for example, has been taken has been abused by those by the rich, for example. So that's a very populist statement. But it also appeals to the kind of everyday person who never felt those privileges and say, yeah, yeah, actually, it was the elites that abused it, right? And here we have Anwar who acknowledges that. We don't trust Anwar, but he's saying the right things. And I think that that there's an acknowledgement that the NEP needs to be reconfigured based on that. And I think because the current government understands that that narrative, which is why I think they are bringing that up a lot in their speeches. Lah. Whether or not it's an actor is a different story. So I need to ask this, Azif, because you said you only spoke to like 100-odd people, 150, 20 mm-hmm. people. I mean, obviously those conversations can be quite detailed lah, and quite long form. But um, the skeptic might say that's not nearly enough and that you could be a bit too naive in your conclusions. How mm-hmm. would you respond? So for me, I think it comes down to methodology, research methodology, right? Um, everyone has certainly 120 
looks small from a qualitative con- from a quantitative perspective. You're just looking at numbers, but I think the point of qualitative research is really to have this long in-depth conversation so that at some point you're able to kind of emerge with themes that make sense across the board. So, and like I said earlier, I wouldn't talk about I think agency as a big point for these youths if it wasn't something that wasn't mentioned across the board very clearly across everyone that I spoke to. Everyone expressed some sense of helplessness. Uh, it just depends on which part of helplessness they're talking about. Everyone expressed. Apathy towards politics. It just depends on what degree of apathy we're talking about. So there is, I think, from method from a methodological perspective point point of view lah, there is value I think in doing in depth research, and hundred is quite a lot for uh for a qualitative research because you know that's hundred people you're speaking to. You're spending about hundred, almost two hundred, three hundred hours. I think if you're talking about one hour per person lah, a lot of time, kind of like getting to the roots of understanding what the what the person's worldview looks like, because worldview informs politics, right? And that is what you cannot capture from surveys. I mean, you and I know, right? In in conducting interviews, um, people don't show themselves in the first ten minutes, yeah. do they? It takes time to warm them up yeah. and to open up, and and you know, kind of like a flower, like, like an onion, yeah. right? And so that long form does make a lot of sense. Um, who who funds the research, though? Again, I mean, I just need to understand the yeah. the, the, you know, obviously the, the quality of the research, mm-hmm. right? Or the qual, or the or the objectives behind it, right? Who's behind Iman and, and who so funded it? So, the, the organization funding this project, so I'm okay to mention this, I guess, yeah. The organization funding this project is the Open Society Foundation. So, there is a lot of focus now, I think, on seeing regional development uh, in Southeast Asia, um, especially for the youth. So, I think there's a lot of recognition from regional actors or international actors that youths in Southeast Asia will be the movers for the next generation or the next few generations. If you see how youth politics have been moving around regionally, we're talking about... Um, Anis, I think, who was one of the younger candidates. Was it Anis? There was, somebody, there was a younger candidate who ran in the Pemilu elections in Indonesia. Uh, in, in, in Thailand itself, case example, the Move Forward Party was basically a young party. Um, so I think there's a lot of investment. There's a lot of, un- there's a lot of need and want, I think, by the international community or regional actors to kind of understand what is actually going on in Southeast Asia. Um, and how can we be a part of capacity building? How can we be part of understanding what the youths want and kind of pushing politics or at least democracy in a more positive manner that's more inclusive? Especially if you consider the fact that globally, the trend is populism. The trend is moving closer towards the right. Yeah. Um, I did ask as well, <clears throat> because your conclusions on how the Malay youths look at the Chinese is actually very interesting. Um, I wouldn't mangle it. I'll let you talk about it. <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> right. uh, so I wrote this a little bit in my more reflective non-formal essay on my website, right? This idea that I think we need, when we talk about politics, we need to also think about what is politics, right? Is, is it, how do, we, how do we form our views about politics? And a lot of it really is shaped by what we personally experience growing up, through our jobs, um, that informs our worldview, our worldview informs about who we decide to vote at the end of the day every five years. So for a lot of these Malay youths, growing up in an environment and states where majority of the population are Muslim Malays, um, and most of the non Malay population are like less than 10%. Lah. In places like Perlis, I think the population for the non Malays are like 2% at most. Um, and in Kelantan, you have non- the non Malay population or the Chinese population being quite minimal. So if you think about how you have minority, pure minority groups operating in these spa- the states where they have to kind of like assimilate, they are forced to assimilate by nature, uh, by environment as well. So you see a more cogial, more socially. Um, more socially, let's say, not flattened, a more socially... Adhesive. Adhesive, yeah. More socially yeah. adhesive, yeah, yeah. adhesive society. Yeah. And I think when you're out to Kelantan, did you have a chance to see, did you have a chance to meet the uh, Chinese, uh, the Peranakan Chinese? They were right? completely integrated. They were completely integrated, right? You cannot distinguish them from Kelantanese. I mean, the in terms of accent. <laughs> yeah, and they, they understand the Malay, they understand the Malay, Muslim culture there. Um, so I... In 2016, I had a chance to kind of like attend one of the uh, one of the uh, temple events held by the Kelantan Chinese, and it was so it was amazing, right? Uh, this was you want to talk about haram, if you want to talk about the term haram, right? These were, they were serving wild boar, they were serving drinks, they were basically uh, they were basically performing a lot of spiritual dances. But for me, yeah. it's like the, the rest of the com- Malay community there understood that was happening, they were okay with it. There was a quick pro quo, there was an understanding that this is how society works in a uh, assimilation model. Um, and if you think about the fact that in this Malay heartlands, non Malays are generally the minority, so they're forced to assimilate, which means there's a more, um, it's more integrative, it's more adhesive. That informs how they think about the non Malays, right? Oh, non Malays, 
the in the Malay majority society, non Malays kind of like follow the flow of it. They assimilate. They don't fight back. Per se, there's a lot of negotiation again on what on what society looks like, and then this is where when they turn to the west coast and then they see a lot of polemical discussions happening here, uh, in Klang Valley in Penang. Uh, that's when they're like, man, these people are out of place. Yeah. Uh, and I think I think that it's like different different ecosystems. Different it's a very worlds, different ecosystem. No yeah. Overla- well, there's very little overlap from a Venn diagram. <laughs> if you, yeah, yeah. You know, perspective. So so it's not that they don't believe multiculturalism. So I think they believe in multiculturalism. They they believe it in its DNA, in that Malaysia is in its DNA. But I think the mold and the understanding of it is shaped really by the environment growing up, knowing that non Malays are a minority. Uh, it's very assimilative. It's very uh, it's very adhesive. But then when they grow up, they go into public universities in KL, or they grow up and they read the news of what's happening in Penang, what's happening in Johor, uh, what's happening in KL, and then they see, wow, the the Chinese are fighting back, and it's all because of DAP. Uh, because that's the Boogeyman Association, right? So then there is this antagonistic view towards the Chinese, not the Chinese that they know in the Malay heartlands, but the Chinese that they know in the West Coast. So the the term, the term that they would use in these interviews was like, oh, I think Allah China DAP. Look at the Penang in, in the Chinese in Penang. And I'm sorry, I know you, I know you Penang guy. Um, but there is this negative association. There's association with the Chinese that becomes political when they see the West Coast Chinese because. No, non-integrative, non-assimilative, asserting for their own cultural rights, um, among other things, um, pushing back against uh, Islam, so to speak. So these are the things that shapes their view of Chinese. It's not that they have a negative view of Chinese as a whole, but those who are not in the Malay heartland are seen as a political category. Yeah. If that yeah, makes sense. and and all of what you talked about so far until now, if they, they seem to be quite easy to fix if you're a politician. Right, yeah. you can actually legislate. You can actually policy this away, mm-hmm. but and and if you and I, I'm I'm I'm, I'm no Albert Einstein lah. You know, uh, you might be. You probably are. <laughs> no, probably not. <laughs> but if yeah. I'm a politician, it's it's quite easy to say these things and to get acquiescence. Right, I just don't understand why. Because if you want a more integrated society, integrate lah. You know, just architect it. Right, legislate it. Uh, you don't have to say things to divide people unless your intentions are really to divide. You know. Well, I do think the intention really is to divide. Because if yeah. you think about, for me, I I like to see twenty eighteen onwards as an interesting study in how Malay political power has been broken up. If you think about the Barisan National Model, where you know Amno is the head of the, the the body and the head of the of the of Malaysia, and everyone kind of falls in tow, you know, MIC, MCA, whatsoever. Um, that's kind of like the model that we kind of grew up believing that that's how it should be. But I think after Amno lost in twenty eighteen, and then there was a Break in political power among the Malays, right? So we see it reflected in the votes as well. We see, we receive, and I think this is why I say that the Malay political consciousness is quite diverse. You have urban Malays who believe in a more reformist, I won't say liberal, but a more reformist idea of how Malay society should be like. You see that in PKR. You see those who are more willing to kind of cross over uh, to more integrated society. Malays who join DAP, who believe that they can work hand in hand with uh, with other races uh, and kind of like enact change. You have those who believe in a more uh, fundamentalist Islamist perspective of the world you have PAS Bersatu is there as an alternative to UMNO unfortunately Bersatu never really came up as a viable <laughs> Malay political uh, alternative to, to any of the discussions that we have with the Malay youths but Bersatu is there to kind of capture the votes that UMNO couldn't um, so if you see how the vote has been broken up among different political parties and how that reflects Malay ideology that that tells you a little bit of where this anxiety is coming from right which is why there's so much calls now for malay polity uh for malay unite unity among right-wing groups because they understood that um they look at dap they look at ph right so they see dap as like, okay how is dap able to kind of like collect all the non-malay or at least chinese votes under one party even though we know Within DAP, there's so many schisms. There's so many different politics, uh, and even the Chinese, even the Chinese communities themselves, are not monolithic. Right? There are many different intersections between them. And I think I heard the interview you did uh, a few months ago with with a policymaker and a, and a former journalist, which I, which I thought yeah, was quite insightful. Free, the, um, it was great. Of, yeah. yeah, I really enjoyed that because it it <clears throat> it's a side of is a side of Malaysian of Malaysian Chinese. I think not many people really look at when people think of Malaysian Chinese, they think of oh Dong Zong, they think of DAP, they think of like a big tent organization. Um, but really within it, I think the, why people go to DAP and then it's kind of like either survival or because it is the only um, viable political party left. Among Malay politics, 
that is not the case, right? Because obviously there is a lot of Malay uh, political power to spread around. Uh, now it's a matter of kind of like whose vote do I win among the Malay communities? Um, so in that sense, yeah, I think now every, now Malay political parties are kind of scrambling for power. So it it is in their interest to kind of like so divide and paint everyone else as the enemy. You see past painting Amno as the enemy. You see Amno painting past as the enemy. Uh, people pays people play. Uh, there's a lot of talk about how Malays who join the AP are seen as traitors to the race. So and all that I think is it's. Is what they want to do. The, the intent is to not unite because there is a, no political incentive to do so. Well, it's the same in the US as well. You can see even at the very top in the yeah. debates, there's no policy there, which is crazy. They're yeah. the most advanced, in inverted commas, country in the world. Um, Undi 18, hmm. um, they, have, they have had their own brick bats, but I, I actually, at a, at a personal level, I think it was fantastic. Oh, no, it was great. Um, yeah. what, what did the youth say about it? So, uh, we need to distinguish between Undi 18 as the legislation and the Undi 18 as the, uh, as the organisation itself. So I think as far as the organisation goes, um, there's a very Klang Valley, very urban-centric sort of movement. Yeah, but in terms yeah. of the... The, yeah, the policy? The pol- yeah, correct. Oh, they loved it. Yeah. I think there was an... Uh, Undi 18 felt like an acknowledgement that youth votes exist. But of course, even within the youth, youths are not monolith, right? So there are, even, there are divisions within the youths as well. So the older youths that I spoke to, so these are the cohorts that are about 20... Nine, 20 and above la. so youths who are like 20, 21 and above who are slightly older uh, were quite critical of the younger ones because they said that the young ones who just had their first elections those who are 18 and 19 who just voted are those who are not necessarily politically literate or because they spend a lot of time on TikTok um, and they don't really know how to discern information between what is factually correct or what is just perception there's a lot of criticality coming from the older cohort like saying that, okay, okay, these young youths need to go through uh, media literacy, uh, ex- media literacy training. They need to go through classes that teach them how to understand how the Malaysian democratic, democratic system works. Um, so even within youths, I think there's an acknowledgement that Yundi 18 was a good thing, but it needed to have come with loads of preparation in terms of educating the youths how the country works, um, which... If you see how education system is right now, only if you're form six do you learn that in pengajian am, or if you go in university, you learn it informally through organisations or youth mo- movements that you join lah, um, or unless you're in an Islamist organisation like PAS, Ikram Abim, uh, sorry Ikram or Isma, you learn it informally as part of your Islamist syllabus in school. So yeah, so if it and again lah, this goes back to agency lah. If you're not any, if you're not part of this system that educates you how the country works, you're basically left with going into an election not knowing, okay, how do I vote? Who do I vote for? How do I make that decision? And if you're then relying on TikTok, which has been infiltrated at that point in time by Prikata National Narratives, and you're most likely... did an amazing then, job. Yeah, and did an amazing job. I think PH was quite slow to that. Yeah. My, I have... A, for me, like, I mean, uh, this one I was discussing, I think, with, with other colleagues, like, is that um, there is... Generational shifts also come with the technology of its time, right? So if you think about how Reformasi, if you think about mass media during Reformasi, a lot of it was blogs. Um, social media didn't come, and Facebook didn't come into the picture until 20, 2007, I think. So people were basically galvanized through blogs, right? Um, people were reading Malaysia Kini, people were writing their own political blogs. That's how you learned about the country in a different perspective. But then you came into 2008, 2007, when Facebook, Twitter uh, became a thing. So people then started galvanizing uh Barisan National was quite slow in that game because for them, it's the mass media game. It's about the newspapers, it's about the TV, it's about the television, it's about radio. But a lot of youths who are at that time reformasi, uh, aligned to reformasi, were picking up technology of that time, right? So they were writing blogs. They were on social media. That's why Twitter is still known as a place where a lot of uh, Pakatan Harapan supporters hang out. But now you have TikTok, which is a generation removed. It's new technology, which is... Um, native towards those who are younger than 20, the Reformasi group, the PH group, is not necessarily in that cohort of technology, which is why I think PH was quite slow to catch up to the TikTok technology because MPN recognized that. So in our conversations that we had with, with a lot of youths, and some of them were past supporters, they were saying that how, how during the state elections, they were voluntarily part of the campaigning group. They weren't being, they weren't paid anything, but they were doing it because for Islam. They were doing it because it was their religious duty to help uh, pass win. And they were, these were people who were 
um, who are doing degrees in mass communication, they were doing degrees in uh, in social sciences. They knew how to craft messages. They knew how to do videos, create production. This was the same sort of people who are running the campaigning during the state and uh, 2022 elections. So you tell me lah whether or not PH was able to catch up to that. Yeah. Yeah, we have yet to see whether they uh, evolve along those lines. Um, Islam, um, yeah. what you found out was actually quite interesting as well. Um, you don't like the polit- well, they don't like seem to like the politicization or the Islamization of politics, but they feel that it's integral in society and in government. Yeah. So how does that work out? So, I think, unless you're speaking to a non-liberal, <laughs> non-liberal Malay, um, I think everyone, most most Malays lah, most Malays would genuinely believe that Islam is a huge part of their identity, right? You see it in the middle and upper class Malays now. If you're thinking about TTDI Malays who, uh, who you know maybe have GLC jobs, but then at their jobs they're also very, they're also very religious, right? Okay, in Petronas, for example, I have a friend who before he joined Petronas. He was, I wouldn't say non-practicing, but he wasn't as religious. But after he joined Petronas, because the culture in Petronas, I wouldn't say is Islamicized, but Islam, Islamic culture is a norm there. So everyone there prays, you know, every every waktu. Everyone there uh, during Ramadan is like kind of expected to kind of follow the rules closely. No one eats behind closed doors, that sort of thing. Um, so if you're thinking about Islam and how it is now, integral part of lives. And this is what I mean when Malays, when Malay Muslims I spoke to say that Islam is integral in their life. It's integral as part of their value system. It's integral in how they view the world and how they want to kind of move forward in life. The problem then they see is how Islamist politics is being weaponized and taken advantage of by past. So there was a lot of, of criticism towards Sanusi, lah, for example, in how NPN during the elections and how they were kind of weaponizing a lot of Islamist language, how they were weaponizing Islam as a way to kind of like um, talk badly about the opposition or saying that this is why we should vote us, right? So I think there was there's negativity there's negativity towards how Islam is being used in a political uh, manner, but that doesn't mean that they're not good, they don't want to be good Muslim, uh, and I think this reflects also in how they view politics, lah. Um, so for me, I see. Islam is important to them and they want to see it as part of public or political life but there's a very different, there's a spectrum here. The yeah. ability to nuance is actually very, very, um, it's, a, it's a very positive thing for me mm-hmm. um, because it shows a maturity beyond yeah. the years. And I'm not sure whether this is the internet or, or social media or conversations among their friends or just a, you know, a more liberal mindset among the youths today but it also shows that that pivot to conservatism in the last elections was not necessarily because they want to be conservative. No. It's more of a protest to, against the it Chinese was. and the PH, yeah. which I understand. I, I get it, right? So so it's all to play for the next elections. Lah. Yes. Uh, right? It's, it's absolutely all to play for. It's all to play for the yeah. next elections, yeah. But so I don't see a discernible change in approach because it just seems that the old tactics are still being played out. Yeah. So that... that that's, that's weird to me though. Yeah, so for me, the biggest question is that what did Perikatan National or Pakatan Harapan learn from the last state elections? What did they learn from the last general elections? They know that the youth, Malay youth vote must be won. But if you see how they've been reacting at every by election since, or even the last state elections, I don't think they changed their approach. PN is not talking about policy. Uh, PH is just riding on their sales of whatever they're doing right now. Uh, so I think... Unfortunately, la, I do think government has kind of like, okay, we have two more years to think about. We have two more years before the next election comes. Let's forget about it. Maybe in our last year leading up to 2027, then we'll gear it back up again. And then we'll see whether or not they learn lessons from uh, from the last election. La. But certainly, in the time between now, a lot of youths have kind of like given up on caring for politics. La. They've given up for caring, yeah. Do you get the sense that they might abstain from the vote then? Or they might just not turn up? I So depending on who we speak to, if you speak to Islamists, Islamist youths, so I'm talking about youths who are maybe part of PAS or part of ISMA or even um, Amana, they will believe that it is their duty, it is their religious duty to vote. So yes, they will participate in the elections, they will campaign, they will, they will, they will be participating in the next elections. But people who are not part of it, there's a big question mark as to if nothing changes in the next, if nothing changes in the next two years, it's likely that they will either abstain or they will present yet another protest vote. But they might present a protest vote against PH, depending on how PHBN does in these next two years. I remember a long time ago when I was voting, this is when Nurul Iza was in uh, yeah. Pantai, um, was it uh, Kerinci. And the Chinese, because we were so sick of the corruption, we actually voted past, you know. 
And because yeah. because we were just so sick of these guys, these jokers. So this is like nothing seems to have changed. And uh, at that time, I was young, lah. You know, yeah. <laughs> like I get why the young do it. Um, but you also get a sense that 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 idealism, that naivety, is is restricted to the young. And as they get older, they get more ingrained in the ways of society. I mean, I've seen a lot of people who join politics with the mm. good intentions, and yeah. they, they just get they just fall into line, lah. Let's not name any names, but yeah. you, you see that time and time again. Yeah, but that's because the so, system. So you you yeah. studied sociology, right? Yeah. So discuss. <laughs> the system incentivizes you to do so. I don't believe anyone who says they can change the system from the inside. No such. Any thing. of my friends I know who said that before they joined politics, and then after they joined, I can see like, yeah, you know what? You're just the same. You've 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 been incentivized by a system that's giving patronage. You're incentivized by a system that says you need you need to play a certain game in order to win votes, and I think that's why a lot of youths are. Apathetic towards it, right? Because they know they they understand the system. There's a lot of distrust against politicians, um, but at the same time, politicians or the political system is basically how you run the country. So it is helplessness. Um, and whether or not they abstain to vote, and you know, we we have to wait and see, lah. <laughs> yeah. So as if, uh, as a student of the human condition, right, and as a keen observer of the human, the Malaysian, the Malaysian persona, lah. I'm sure that it must tickle you a lot in terms of the observations you made, and what you know, what drives the the, the Malaysian. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think? Where do you think the next? What 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 do you think will drive the next ten years for the Malaysian? And I know this is a huge, it's huge, a huge question. It's a huge question. I mean, I'm just thinking about fundamentally, lah. Like, what is it that Malaysians want, right? I think at the end of the day, I mean. If you're boiling it down to right now, we feel like there's a lack of direction with the country, right? And it has been so since 2018. I think after 2018, people kind of lost their way. Um, those who were supportive of PH were obviously quite happy that they had PH, but the trade-off was they had Mahathir as a PM, lah, <laughs> which was not was not great for anyone. Bizarrely, they thought the economic policies under Najib were more directed. Which is true. I mean, yeah. so if, if with a lot of the Malays youths that I spoke to, they romanticized Najib quite a lot. So, and this this isn't to say that they supported Najib, one and B and corruption. They acknowledged that. But then they were saying how, you know, Zaman Najib Lu, we saw the world change in front of us. We saw things materially develop, right? We're talking about UTCs, uh, the, urban trans- the urban transformation centers uh, in rural areas where prior to this, you had to go to different places in order to get your work with government done. But now you had it all in one place. Uh, they saw... The LPT2 come up, right? Which is the Liburaya um, Pantai Timo going across the East Coast. Where previously, maybe it was just you had to use the trunk road or the roads were badly maintained. Or that you had to get off at Kuantan and then just take the coastal road all the way up. Now, you're able to access the East Coast all the way up to Kota Baru. So, and if you're talking about granular details, I, uh, I was a student during the time when Najib was PM. And I remember a lot of the things that happened, I mean, that was given, right? And we're talking about BRIM, the cash aids, we're talking about Kadera Aids to Malaysia, where granted, they worked together with Maidin to kind of like, it was probably it was probably a contract that they had Maidin to kind of like slap on a more generic Malaysia, one Malaysia brand, but essentially, they marked down the prices. They made things affordable. They had, um, and we're talking about laptops, which one Malaysia laptops that were given to a lot of students, underprivileged students. So, a lot of youths of my generation and a little bit younger remember these things as transformative, right? They remember these things as, oh, this Najib might be problematic, but at least there was a direction. At least the, at least the, the National Transformation Plan looks at it as something. And uh, the one thing which I, I'm surprised nobody really talks about so much that happened during Najib's time was that Najib's government had this thing called the TN50, which is Transformation Nacional Limo Pulo, where they interviewed, they brought together youths from all over the country to kind of go on in to kind of attend a conference to basically discuss what is it that they want to see for the country in the next 50 years. Um, a lot of the findings from that conference was never made public. Uh, basically, it's sitting somewhere in KBS, my office. Sadiq didn't touch it. Any of the KBS ministers are not touching it now. But for me, like if you go into that drawer and try to find what I said, that could be your roadmap for the next 50 years. But why isn't anyone doing it? Why isn't this government or any government at least prior to this point thinking about, hey, our youths have had have actually attended like a mega conference in KL where they actually discuss what they wanted the futures to be. Why isn't anyone looking to that? So for me, where we are right now, I think Malaysians just feel well lost. 
uh, and when we feel directionless, that's where the tribalism comes in and why everyone's fighting for their own corner, right? So you see uh, the Chinese community is being quite defensive, I think, around certain issues where if they see Islamist policies or Islamist-like policies kind of interrupting with, with their culture or whatnot, you get a bit defensive. And that's understandable. Or you see the Malays becoming more defensive because they feel like Pakatan or DAP uh, is uh, challenging they are challenging what should be Islamic uh, rights, law, so to speak. So we're at the stage now where I think there's so much polarization, there's so much tribalism, and what we're lacking, I think, is a unifying direction to say that, okay, this is where Malaysia is going to be, this is how we're going to position ourselves in the region or in the global stage. Um, we're lacking that right now. Well, it's a bit like if you have Wayne Rooney, uh, you, if you have Cristiano Ronaldo, and you've got Sanani on in one team, and mm-hmm. then they all want to you know, get golden boot or whatever. Yeah. Um, but the thing is with Alex Ferguson, there was a common goal. There was. Then bled, you win the Premier League, right? We don't have that commonality. We don't have that common goal. We don't have that common goal because we don't have the statesman to do it. You don't have that elder statesman or even just the statesperson yeah. to say, come on, Malaysia, just you're 33 million people. You're a bit of a pimple in the ocean. Let's get your act together and let's go and do it together because your diversity is your biggest strength. I don't see that. But it, it seems... That we've had people of that caliber in the past. Again, I'm not going to name any names, but they fell into line with um, with the zeitgeist like, which is yeah. that whole thing, right? Yeah. I don't get it, man. You know, you get it. I I get it, and I'm no Einstein. You know, yeah. what? Unless they don't want it that way, they want it this way, which is this, right? Yeah, but I don't know whether everything is connected. Yes, I think. I mean, if you're primarily talking about what people want right it's, they don't want yeah, they yeah. don't want the country they want themselves they want themselves yeah they want to enrich themselves yes. but and but that's the thing which i'm trying which i still am trying to grapple with right is this idea that okay i mean fine every, everyone in politics most people in politics are in it for self enrichment um but then i'm also thinking whether could you and so this is maybe the controversial point like could you self enrich while also being a statesman and we see that happening with a uh, prime minister a few prime ministers ago of 20 years, yeah, right? I mean, just don't glow joy lah. You yeah. makan, you makan. You don't have to feast at the bloody buffet for yeah. generations. I mean, that's where it falls apart, isn't it? Yeah. I don't think there's a totally honest politician in the world. Certainly, I they're agree. not adding totally in Singapore either, right? Yeah. We can see the confusions there as well. But, um, yeah. but the interesting but thing... But by and large, yeah. the country at, at, at heart, right? Yeah. But it, the interesting thing is, if you're discussing about um, creating a vision of a statesman, uh, among politicians, right? I think there's an interesting thing that one of our one of our former politicians now he's temporarily outside. You know, is <laughs> uh, is clearly trying to position himself, right? So so there's a platform he's using which is quite popular among the youth. So when I was going around, I the, find yeah, that platform inher- inherently troublesome. It is, but it's yeah, riddled with conflict. It is, but if you're talking about youth who are looking for something to make sense of things, so if you're talking about youth trying to make sense of policy. Is there any other platform that is actually discussing policy in a way that feels engaging with a speaker who is quite charismatic? Um, two speakers anyway, like, who, who, who are able to hold a very engaging but still thoughtful conversation about policy. And I think if we read the market, people are not dedicating a lot of the media space into breaking down more complicated subjects into things that youths want to learn about. So if you're talking about, say for example, finance, the only finance... Uh, the only Malay finance content creator that I know called Financial Fight is he's, he's the only good. one. He's yeah. great. I love the work. But yeah. if you see about if you see other Malay content creators in that space, they're talking about crypto. They're talking about investment, making investments which are um which veer a little bit more towards things like Forex, which are not which are not about building fundamentals, right? It's about getting rich. Yeah. And I'm just thinking, I mean, as a person so when I was in BFM, I think you remember that I was doing the Malay Malay programming, right? So I was a bit. I think I was a bit young, so I didn't understand what was needed in that field. But then, when I, ten years now onwards, right, I'm thinking about how, man, the Malay, the Malay con, the Malay media field, ne- needs so much of uh, the most basic things like um, complex conversations about people want to know about policy, but they don't understand it. So how do you package a media that discusses policy in an engaging manner the same way Klaus Kajab does? How do you talk about finance, which is ve- which can be quite a complicated topic, but how do you discuss it in a way that is helpful for a Malay-speaking audience um, or even t- relationships? 
Um, and a lot of these are kind of hodgepodge here and there, uh, but nobody's really dedicating time to kind of like grow this space, right? Um, in Indonesia, for example, I think there was a, I was told by a few friends who attended it uh, a few months ago where they went to Jakarta and there was a f- fair, there was a fair um, where each different parts of the fair had different um had different thing had different courses so to speak so there was one there was one aspect so there was one room that was teaching you about okay this is how uh cruise is coming this is how marriage looks like right uh, we're talking about emotional connection with your uh with your partner we're talking about how to be responsible how to communicate well there's another room that was discussing financial basic financial literacy talking about uh compounding interest talking about how you should think about uh how the credit cards operate uh, there's another one that talks a little bit more about policy making and leadership. Talking about okay, these are how, this is how you can talk to your uh, to your local politician. This is how you should think about policy. This is how you should think about if you want to advocate for certain things. These are conversations happening in grassroots Indonesia, that is not happening in Malaysia. So I think, and I think I boil this back down to the fact that as Malaysians, we also kind of rely a lot on leaders. We do the patronage thing, but there's no really movement among communities to kind of like do things for ourselves. We saw that a bit during the COVID, uh, the pandemic era, the kita jaga kita thing. Yeah. But where's that gone to now? You know? Yeah, and I think the people that, the powers that be, the elites who are benefiting from the system, they are pro- obviously profiting from the lack of usable knowledge, even at, you know, whether it's social, emotional, financial levels. And, I mean, financial faiz is, is, is in some sense uh, an outlier because yeah. he's the, he does it. And But you can't, I mean, you can and, sh- and perhaps it can happen at an organic level, but if it doesn't, mm. the powers that be are not going to engineer it because maybe their intentions are not honourable, right? Yeah. And, that's the, and that's the biggest problem uh, Malaysia faces because we don't have leaders who have the country at heart. They've got themselves at heart. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and the person you spoke to in the past, I mean, I not want to say his name, but um, he, he, he could have been the Kennedy, you know? He could have yeah. been. He, he could have been, been the Gandhi. He could have been, right? Yeah. Smart enough, eloquent enough, charismatic enough for sure, Right, but alloy. I mean, yeah. So then it goes back to the question: of How much money is enough? Right. Mm-hmm. And how much I th- more money you want? Yeah, I mean, we can go on. I think and about on, how on. politicians are, you know, not really contributing to to the country's better development. And I think this is why I like to think of the alternative, right? Which for alternatives, like if if you're talking about where power resides, right? So right now, Malaysians believe, and we still do, seem to believe that a lot of power resides with. Uh, with political parties and yes to an extent it does when, when we talk about policy making but what I see lacking are conversations around how do we make our communities stronger that's something that Pro- Professor Tajudin talked about you know yeah. that decentralization that, yeah. that that knowledge that rather than outsource your future to the to a government mm-hmm. there's this move back towards the individual and to the family yeah. and and that that's very good because mm-hmm. that that kind of like takes away the, the power base of the elites back into the into the people you yeah know, that, that the realization you know yeah exactly did you see that i i believe in the same thread of thinking that prof tajudin does and to an extent it, that even edin believes that. so we're talking about how communities need to kind of like right. take on their own destinies right so, but how i see it happening in malaysia right now as it is so we're talking about if you're talking about community-based grassroots movements i don't really see it emerging or going beyond say residence associations so resident and if we know resident associations a lot of it really is about protecting private property Gosh, right it's thorny as hell. yeah i mean ttdi uh the ttdi resident association is very strong very effective when it comes to kind of going up against uh dbkl but really at the end of the day it really is kind of to protect the culture of ttdi right as as opposed to kind of going further thinking about can we galvanize a community say um to do other things um say the gutwara i mean James Shai, um, don't know if you ever had him on. You should. He's, he's quite. He, his book was quite interesting, right? He talked about hope and Malaysians. Um, and one of his case studies, I think, was the Gurdwara in BJ, that during the floods, um, two to three years ago, they basically galvanized the entire PJ community to kind of go uh, to kind of help each other, right? Cook meals, uh, go and rescue people, and that sort of sort of community movements that we see outside times of crisis. Where did they go to? Where did that go to, right? And I think right now we are lacking a lot of that. And, and the reason why I bring that up was because in two thousand and in the 2010s, so I was in my 20s around that time, before the 2018 elections, this might have been part of a reformasi wave for all we know. But I remember every week or every month, there will always be some sort of grassroots 
uh, program that's going on among university students, among the youths, where, say for example, um, there was uh, Buku Jalanan that was started by a group of youths in UIA, in Gomba, and that kind of like spread throughout the entire public university system, uh, public university kind of movement in the peninsula, where interested youths just got together to talk about to talk about books. But when they started discussing these political books, it started to be this. It started to become about thinking a bit more about their politics, thinking about the country a bit more. And all of this was run by uh, the grassroots themselves. It wasn't influenced in any way by anyone from political parties. But post twenty eighteen, I'm not seeing that same sort of energy going on now. Well, maybe they devolved that thinking back to Madia because they're all... Perhaps, yeah. A, a white knight has come and, s- and saved yeah. us. Oh, Madia come and save us. Oh, whatever, right? Yeah. Um, we haven't talked about the Indians and the, you know, and the, um, the, the small communities as mm-hmm. well, though. And we should because obviously... Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, how did the Malays look at the Indians and the Punjabis and, and the other, you know, the Indian community? In our conversations, they don't come up as much, unfortunately. So because I think the, the, the larger boogeyman is the Chinese. The larger boogeyman is the Chinese. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting, right? But but the interesting part is that when we're talking about who do you have good relation, good relationships with, from not from your own race, not from your own ethnic groups, they tended to be more friendlier. The Malay youths tended to be more friendlier towards their Indian friends. So they will speak quite highly of their friends. Not to say they don't speak highly of their Chinese friends, but they seem to gel easier with their Indian friends. So even in Kelantan, right? So I was having conversations with a Kelantan youth who went on to KL to work for a while. You know, saying, oh yeah, I, I, I lived in a house, I lived in a in a flat with, with my Indian housemates. It was great. I love them, you know? And do, do you know, even in the city, yeah. I, I see that the Indians, um, and not necessarily just the mama, you know, the Muslim uh, mm. Indians, right? They are more. They are more open to to speaking in Malay. They are more open to being more um, integrated into the Malay community, just in the way that they talk, the accent, everything, yeah. right? I'm not sure why that's the case, and maybe because the Chinese are more. I, I guess you know. I, I th- you know we talked about this with the other scholars, right? This whole education, this whole mm. uh, ecosystem, the business uh, chambers of commerce, very very, and it's thousands and thousands of years old. Yeah. You know. So it's interesting that you mentioned how uh, the Indian community was more is 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 more willing to kind of like um, kind of not integrate lah, but kind of be friendlier towards Malay culture, because during the state elections last year in Selangor at least. I attended um I attended Prekata National's manifesto launch in Shah Alam and there was quite a, a lot of Indian political mini Indian political parties who were there and f- no Chinese ones but Indian ones which I thought oh, that's that's fascinating right yeah. I mean what is the affinity politically that the Indians were able to kind of find with the Malays um yeah, yeah. um so so you went to the um, PN man- manifesto launch right yes and I saw and, a lot of yeah. Uh, I saw a lot of uh, Indian political, mini political parties that were willing to join the coalition, but none that were Chinese. And it it made me wonder, like, and I think this is where it comes down to anecdotes. Because for me, Alex, I spend a lot of time on messaging bots and comment bots just to kind of understand what people are thinking. I know in real life, people won't say these things. Like but any good journalist yeah, should, right? They will say a lot of it online because of anonymity, right? So they're able to become their worst selves online. But that tells you a little bit about how they think about certain issues. And I think it boils down to this belief that the reason why, perhaps, and I'm not saying all Indian communities do so, but perhaps there is a solidarity in feeling, there's a solidarity, there's a solidarity with the Malay community in feeling like the Chinese community, um, not to say controls the economy, but has a very influential hold over uh, economic development or political decision-making. Uh, and because the Malay community victim has self-victimized themselves um, for so long, for decades, that the only ally I think that makes sense for the Indian community really is to go to the Malays because at least if the Malay community co- comes back into power, uh, into full power, the way AMNO used to be, um, maybe there's some sort of protection going on there. And this is reflected, I think, also in Malaysian politics, uh, larger Malaysian politics. If we think about how in Najib's last years, he came up with the Indian transformation plan, was it? Um, there, was a, there was a blueprint, sorry, the, Indi- the, Mali- the Indian the Malaysian Indian Blueprint Plan or something like that, of that sort. He came up with a very extensive blueprint on how to transform the socio-economic lives of the Indian community. Najib was very well aware, I think, of the sort of problems that were happening within the Indian community and wanted to address that in his blueprint. And I think if you ask most academics who have studied that blueprint, they say that, you know, that is the best blueprint that has actually come out for the Indian community. But of course, after 2018, again, like many things, uh, legacy-related things, that blueprint was not touched. 
But I think that speaks a lot to the idea that that maybe there's an infinity based on the enemy. Sorry, is it the en- the f- what's that term you call the enemy of my enemy is my friend? Basically, the Indian community may find it easier to align in the Malays or culturally blend together the Malays because the uh, Chinese community is perhaps seen as too difficult for them to either integrate with or too difficult to kind of like work together with. Yeah. Yeah. Unless, a, you're, for the, or unless you're the same class, like middle class and whatnot. Out of war tactics, like, right? Yeah. Yeah. Just uh, galvanize your forces to overcome the larger evil or something along those lines. Mm. I want to ask you, right, and this is a very thorny question, this, the, this is the policy conundrum, because if we want to move together as a nation, as, assuming there's a sense that we want to, la, but um, you can't have, because there's three different, you know, um, factions at play, yeah. and the way Malaysia has been structured is, is the preservation of those three edifices, la, you know. So, so how do you move forward as a nation, as a Malaysian country, when you've got three different very forces, very di- three very different forces at play? And you've constantly got this power struggle going on, you know. I go back to psychology, lah. In this sense, I mean, I, I, I think I, 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 nowadays I like to think about the state of the nation closely to um, how one thinks about one's own personal psychology. Like, uh, take for example, trauma. Our national trauma can be summed up, I think, in May thirteen, where a lot of resentment that the Malays had socioeconomically emerged in May 13 uh, against the Chinese, right? So we had bloodshed. But nobody really talks about May 13, right? Uh, we talk about it hush-hush. Maybe Malaysia can even cover it once a year and then there'll be uproar or don't talk about don't talk about May 13. But really, when there has there ever been a conversation in the past 40, 50 years, 40 years lah actually, in the past 30, 40 years about what May 13 really meant between the Chinese and the Malays, right? Um, and I think if you're talking about therapy, lah, <laughs> if, you're talk- if you're talking about kind of like talking about what really matters, we don't have a space where they have actually had a dialogue, a proper dialogue, right? F- say, for example, between national leaders or between community leaders talking about grievances. Um, a Malay having conversation with an Indian or Chinese person really about, hey, these are the things that bother me about your community, right? Yeah. Why doesn't your community want to assimilate? Why doesn't your community want yeah. to learn the Malay language? Yeah. Malay, the Malaysian language is a language for everyone. Again, I mean, Prof. Dajud didn't talk yeah. about this. The Chinese are equally to blame. Hmm. I mean, look, yeah. he, asked, he, 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 thought, he asked his students, right, in, in UKM, he says, how many of you have spent a night in your Chinese friend's house, mm-hmm. right, uh, as, as whatever, as kids or as yeah. teenagers, right? You don't understand them. And then you ask the th- th- Chinese, when, when did you uh, go and sleep in your Malay neighbor's house and yeah. spend a night there or, or over a weekend? Very, very little nowadays. In mm. fact, even on public holidays and uh, celebrations, we don't even go to each other's houses anymore. Yeah. Right? I think right now, Malaysia as it is, we live in silos. I'm thinking of, for example, if you've ever been to Mangi, you should. It feels, Sense of the universe. It feels like a different <laughs> place altogether because yeah. it's so Islamicized. But then you think about this, you think about Islamists. Uh, Islamists love living in Bangi because it feels like their own little bubble. But then you also see a similar eco bubble in the Sapak City and Mount Kiara. Mount Kiara, uh, where is their own little personal bubble. It feels safe there, which is great, right? Uh, it's it's good to feel safe in your own neighborhoods. But at the same time, when you when you build neighborhoods, and this uh, this is why I think I'm also interested in urban planning to an extent, right? Because how you design a city or how you interv- how the government intervenes or how developers decide how a city looks like also tells us a lot about how we're able to kind of see ourselves as as a community. So if you think about KL, I mean, if you're thinking about big cities like London uh, or New York, for example, right? That, and it, maybe this is more of a media thing, but even on online bots, when I see about how New Yorkers talk about themselves, Sure, there will there's a recognition of I think racial discrimination and whatnot. But when they talk about New York, when New Yorkers or Londoners talk about themselves, they talk about themselves as a cohesive a collective. Collective. Yeah. But we don't see even KL. We talk about KL, right? We don't see people in Kuala Lumpur uh, talking about themselves as a collective. Yeah, this is my city, right? Kuala Lumpur is my city. Yeah. But when we talk about Klang Valley, we talk about our different factional yeah. uh, neighborhoods like Puchong, Bukit Jalil. We talk about Shah Alam. Which are also very racialized, right? Shalam, majority Malay, Puchong, Ch- Cheras. Even Cheras is this is divided somehow between the more Malay side and the more Chinese side. So if you think about how we choose to live in silos, is it's not it's not unthinkable that our politics also reflects yeah. that sort of divisions. Yeah. 
So your your research, um, the the more important part are your recommendations, I think, right? Mm. Because that's that's there's no point talking about pain points yeah. without offered solutions, right? Yeah. Can you please cherry pick the the top three that you think would would move the needle in some sense? The first to me would be to find a way for youths, at least because we're talking about the study, right? We talk talk about you. Actually, how, how many how many million are we talking about? Uh, the Malay youth. Oh, I don't have the number off the top of my head. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it would but be easily ten to fifteen percent. B- right? About so, yeah, ten yeah. to fifteen percent sounds about right. People, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give or take. And there needs to be acknowledgement that these are also majority population of the at least peninsula, mm. majority population of the peninsula, right? And you think about how most of them are, most of them are collected up in the northern states, and maybe some parts of Johor a little bit into Melaka and Perak lah. Yeah. But how do we allow them to mix with each other mix with other races um it's interesting there's there's an interesting there's an interesting that I've, interesting thing that i found throughout the, my studies which is that most of the malay youth that i've met said that throughout my entire life i lived in kind of like a monocultural society mostly malays if not exclusive malays but my first point of contact with a non malay was in public university mm. Up to that point, there was a lot of stereotypes around how non-Malays were like Chinese or Indian otherwise. Lah. But being in university, an environment that was you know, about growing up, about kind of learning, learning about your own identity and being able to be friends and have a positive environment to interact with someone from the other race, left them with very good impressions of the other race. And this is what I think when, I, when we talk about how they believe in multiculturalism, this is one of the instances where engagement with another race led them to positive view of like, actually, yeah, Malays and Chinese and Indians can live together, right? We can respect each other. Of course, there's a bit more subtlety behind that in terms of how maybe there's a bit of cautiousness in how a non-Malay may, may, may engage with a Malay because maybe they don't offend their religious sensibilities and whatnot. But the fact remains is that the, the public university was the first place where a Malay, most Malays from Malay heartlands had a chance to interact with a non-Malay. And I think that's positive. The question is, is it, is... At 18 years old, is that too late of a time? Can we make it much earlier? right? And I think the Barisan National Government probably had an idea to apply that sort of hypothesis at an earlier level. Maybe they wanted to do it on a larger scale through, bar- through, um, through national service, right? And anyone who's attended national service who, who has come back saying that it felt more like a summer camp <laughs> than it actually did as a proper national service. But I'm, I'm thinking of the Singapore... I'm thinking about the Singapore, Singapore model of a national service, which where... Every Singaporean individual has the chance to serve, um, not in internship, but something like an internship in different public um, civil service parts, right? So they can be part of the police, they can be part of the fire, uh, part of the fire brigade, part of the army. And if you think about the idea of building a community and feeling like you're a part of it, belonging a part of it, responsible for it, Malaysia seems to like that model where because we're living in our own silos, and a lot of protective parents say, okay, no, we don't want to send our kids to national service. They're very protective and whatnot. Then you think about, you're thinking about, we have a generation that thinks, that doesn't feel responsible towards their own communities. So they then they grow up thinking that, they grow up thinking about their own politics, which is that, okay, this is my own politics, but I don't have any sense of responsibility towards Malaysia. I don't have any responsibility towards my own community, towards other people who I should care for. And, unless they are within my personal circle. And I think that's problematic. We don't want... Individualism is okay. But I think what Malaysians seem to be lacking now is this sense of responsibility towards what, what do we owe each other, right? What do we owe uh, to each other? We owe each other a sense of community. We owe each other, you know, love for one another, right? And I think we lack that. Yeah. What I've found surprising through the years is that although there's so many differences and so many grievances, it hasn't really spilled over um, Thankfully. beyond yeah, yeah. Right, beyond social dissonance, lah, right? Hmm. Um, why do you think that is? Is it because there's enough food on the table? Is that why? I think so, yes. I mean, if we talk... Because if, if yeah. stomachs are hungry, then you get something Then you get something, you. Yeah. yeah. So, so I mean, I'm thinking about um, I'm thinking about countering, I'm thinking about CVE, right? Which is uh, countering violent extremism. And in a lot of the cases, in a lot of studies that are done in CVE, one of the main proponents for, for violent extremism to become very effective um, and very attractive as well 
is if there are unmet needs in the community. So if well, someone we seem is, to be moving towards that, but we are moving towards that a little bit more. But the interesting part about I think how Malaysia um, has it is that even though the Malay communities have been some Malay communities have been disenfranchised, at least there's political power. Mm. At least Amno is there or Pas is there, and then there's an illusion as though the Malay the Malay elite are managing um, whatever problems at hand. But if you see May thirteen for what it was, which is that the Malay community at that point of time felt like their socio economic needs were unmet and they were impoverished compared to the the Chinese community, and we saw how some people can say lah there was political invention, but regardless of political invention, extremism broke out. There was violence, uh, and that really emerged from the fact that some people's bellies weren't full. So I think Malaysia has been lucky so far, and I think I don't think we appreciate how lucky we are actually. You know, we are almost seventy years into a national post-colonial project where we are living together. There are maybe small little racial tensions here and there that emerges in some sort of maybe communal violence. Uh, maybe somebody beats up another person of another race, but it doesn't spill into a larger endemic. Yeah. Uh, and it's quite well managed. And I think, and I think this is something that we don't see as an asset. That you know what, regardless of how messy Malaysia is. We're okay. Yeah. Uh, we're privileged in that sense compared to other countries, and we're not seeing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I totally agree. I mean, look, look, at, look no further than America, right? Yeah, it's horrible there. It is. Um, yeah, and, and even the UK. Like yeah. I've been to the UK for three years. It was. I'm not saying that I don't like the UK. There are there are a few things I appreciate about my few years in the UK, but it is not Malaysia. It doesn't. It is. It looks clean on top, but actually things are really. It's bad. completely. <laughs> yeah, it's a rot. God. It's rotting. Yeah. Stabbings and what yeah. the hell. So any so I want to move on to um, basically more broadly uh, Malaysia's youth uh, of which you you mm-hmm. remain a, a part of. <laughs> I don't know. I'm I'm almost getting out of that that age range. Yeah. Um. Let's let's end with your you know kind of like your your statements there uh, because um what I've tried to, what I've seen among the, the the younger set there seems to be I in, in no in no order of uh, importance uh, the repudi- a, a repeat. The repudiation of technology, hmm. a move but back towards you know the old fashion. You know, for example, you. Um, what really interested me in your work was not really your your sociological not my, not my latest stuff. Yeah, yeah. No, no, it's it's what you used to do like eight, five, ten years ago when when you used to just board a train, go to yeah. Kamaman, go and look at the boat builders, take photographs of them, write glorious articles about it, and just really study Malaysiana, right? Yeah. And what young person does that nowadays? You know, they're stuck behind the screen and. I don't know. Is is that a broad generalization about where the youth are in terms of just like I've had enough of this world. I'll just go back to what it used to be in in the, in my parents, you know, rose tinted past lah. You know. Yeah, I certainly see a bit of that among the youths lah. Where I wouldn't say they're rejecting technology, but I think they're using technology now in a way that is able to tap into into that right. So I mean, if you're talking about lack of agency, if you're talking yeah. about apathy towards politics, or even the world, right? If you're talking about how youths are now on their feet, seeing, oh my god. Uh, war in Gaza, genocide in Gaza. We are seeing climate change destroying, uh, destroying the world bit by bit. So I think there is a, there is a way how the, how can we use technology? I'm thinking of how. Throughout the years, I see people of my age group and younger, who are embracing, and I wouldn't say retro lah, but they are interested in things like typewriters. Yeah. Or they're interested in, uh. What do you call those things? Um, vinyl. Record players. Record yeah. players, vinyl. What do you call this uh, thing? <laughs> yeah, I, I've never actually played vinyl before. Uh, CDs, yes. And tape, uh, Apple and, and, and cassette tapes, right? Um, or they're interested in uh, vintage items. So my sister, for example, runs a vintage business, a vintage clothes business. Yeah. Uh, so she is completely interested in how the dresses that, you know, previous generations used to wear. And I think... Part of it is maybe an economic decision because you know fast fashion and clothes right now are so expensive. So maybe let's thrift, right? It is is environmental friendly, but you also have old technology which is available, is cheap to access, and you connect to something tactile. Um, so the one thing which I've been doing uh, recently, I, I did it a little bit when in my twenties, but now I'm back to it again. Is that I'm actually using film again, right? Because there's something about the process that makes me feel grounded. And I think if we compare it to the technology now, right? Where okay, instant gratification. Uh, I get my pictures. I'm able to edit it. But with a film camera, for example, I take a picture. I have to wait, well, a week 
back then I think it used to be longer than that. <laughs> but I just wait a week <laughs> before my guy comes back with my processed images and I don't edit them, right? Because then it feels more real. It feels like, okay, I'm not editing it because if I took it wrong, if something's out of focus, that's part of the experience as well. It's okay to accept imperfections. And I think the move back towards uh, more, what was that term that you used? Retro? Not retro. The, there was a term about repudiation technology, something like that. Repudiation. Yeah, repudiation against technology. Yeah. I think is a part of connecting with that authenticity, Maybe right? Maybe there's an association yeah. with the modern era and all the you know, excesses of, of, the, yeah. of today and all the damage that's been caused. So like, I just want to like, it's like watching a movie, like, you know, I go back in the past and I get lost yeah. in the, the whole suspension of reality thing. Yeah. And I think if you think about the media environment now, right, about how TV is being produced, everything is very uh, quantitative or what do the audience is like. Let's make, a, let's make a movie or a TV show that, that follows the data. Yeah. You lose a lot of the human touch. You lose a lot of the authenticity or this space for spontaneity or creativity to kind of flourish. And I think a lot of youth also pick up on that, which is why, you know, they're rejecting these things, right? which is why on TikTok, and I know most people have certain opinions about TikTok, but for me, it's quite interesting because I see trends on TikTok where youths would go back and look at things which were trendy five, ten years ago. They would look for old songs and then remix it back into right. the new. That's which to right. me is like, yeah. oh, that's a song from like the 70s. Like, how did you go? Some, one of you, one of the influences or one of, your early, one of the earlier trendsetters might have, must have gone through old catalogs of music, thought that, hey, this was cool. I'm going to bring it back into the... Uh, I'm going to bring it back in 2024. So there is a looking back to the past. And I think it's interesting to talk about looking back to the past, right? Because then that it tells us that there's something about the now which is lacking in terms of identity. That they're lacking, because they're lacking agency or the way forward or a direction forward, they don't know how to chart it in this very um, messy world. That looking back at the past gives them hints or ideas of how can we form our identity or our futures moving forward. Uh, so for me personally, lah, the reason why... Um, I did my project where I was documenting Malaysia years ago, 10 years ago like, actually, was uh, prompted by a few things. What, for the first was a movie called what, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. I like that. That's yeah. such a wonderful yeah. film. I love it. I love it because um, this was a guy who worked at, I mean, the premise of the movie essentially like, is just a guy who's worked in a dead end, not that end job, like, but more or less something like that for four decades, right? Until he was pushed out of his circumstance into an adventure, right? But then that taught me, like, huh, that's interesting, right? I mean, in our 20, in my 20s, I was like, yeah, I want to do that. Um, my first solo trip was actually to Bangkok, uh, sorry, was to Chiang Mai. So it was a solo trip. I went to Chiang Mai. I stayed, I stayed in like a rundown hotel for like two weeks. And I met a lot of white people when I was there. I met a lot of Westerners. No, uh, and I say that, I say that because it was quite, ref it was a turning point for me, right? So when I was talking to a lot of them, they were very unhappy with their lives back in whatever country they were from, whether it was the UK or Norway or America. And they were saying, oh, yeah, you know, I didn't like my life back there. It was, you know, you know I was working nine to five. But here, I can be anyone. I, I found myself here. And I was like, thinking, I mean, there was a reflective point at me then. Like, I was thinking, actually, why do you need to go somewhere else to find, quote unquote, find yourself, you know? I mean, there's a lot of privileges that come with being a Westerner into a Southeast Asian country. Like, but the bigger question to me was that, did I need to find myself by going somewhere else? Why couldn't I do it back home in Malaysia where this Tanah Tumpah Nidaraku, yeah, right? Yeah. So that's why I think ever since then, like I've, I've always pushed for this idea that actually I want to travel around Peninsula Malaysia. I want to meet people in Peninsula Malaysia. I want to learn about the histories and stories because then that tells me a lot about who we are as a people, our histories, which are not well documented. Um or not funded well enough to be documented, or in some places, there's a lot of disproportionate funding being given to fund it. And so unfortunately for me, like, like Penang is, has a lot of documentation of its history and culture, but for me, the one thing which I always feel a little bit disappointed about is that why isn't the same focus being given on, say, places like Perlis, Kedah, um, the East Coast, for example, where there's so much culture. So Edin Ku's work for Pusaka, for example, is great because there's a preservation of Kelantanese, uh, not indigenous, but Kelantanese Malay culture, right? Um, but when I went to, for example, a story which I felt was um, emblematic of that was that when I went up to the East Coast in 2016, um, years ago, I stumbled upon this one place called Bukit Besi. Uh, a friend of mine who lives in Dungun introduced me to that place. When I went there, I was like, wow, this place is great. Why is no one talking about it? Why isn't the state government funding this? And then they were saying, yeah, no one's, just, no one's interested in history, but Terengganu used 
to fund. Terengganu used to be the richest state in Peninsula Malaysia, and anyone who worked in those Bukit Besi mines were considered setaraf lah, equivalent of a petronas engineer. They were being paid the equivalent of petronas engineer. That's how that's how rich Terengganu was as a state um, about hundred two hundred years ago. But now it's kind of forgotten. So I went there and I thought, you know what, I want to document this place. So I came back with two other friends. We essentially met anyone who we felt was still alive, and we did meet someone lah who 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 was in his eighties and nine, who was in his eighties, and still remembered when he was working in the mines when he was eighteen. And it was so interesting to learn about that because then you see, oh yeah, Malaysia is quite global, right? We had interactions with the Chin, we had interacting interactions with the Japanese, we had interactions with Western powers. Um, there were. African slaves. There were there were slaves from the African continent that was brought into Terengganu, but was not well documented. So a friend of mine, Dina Zaman, is actually now exploring her own personal history, and what she's found interesting so far is that Terengganu used to have a culture where there were African slaves. But why was that? Why is that not being mentioned? I didn't know that. They did. I it's didn't know it's that, so yeah. fascinating. And the royals used to have them. The elite used to have African slaves, but somehow in our course of history, we don't acknowledge it anymore. And nobody talks about it, so it goes. But yeah, so when I was talking in Bukit Besi, I was told by someone who used to be a mate for for one of the uh, British uh, engineers that yeah, we had we had like Awang Hitam who are working here, right? Um, where are they now, right? So I documented, I basically documented the entire place lah, as as the best as I could. Um, and many years later, uh, thankfully now, so when I came back about two when I came back about two years ago, I saw that the state government finally. They set up like a mini little museum at Bukit Besi, and for me, as I think, yeah, thank goodness. I mean, if there was no one there, uh, if no one bothers to document, our, no one else will bother our, document our own history by ourselves, lah. A lot of times, we rely on international organizations like Net Geographic, National Geographic, or or Discovery, or international. Uh, news wires to kind of come down Malaysia, find something interesting and document it, and then we feel oh we validated oh yeah great somebody from the outside cares about Malaysia, but why don't we care about Malaysia first, right? I think that's one of the unspoken or less spoken benefits of social media because now everybody is a journalist, right? Mm. All you need is a smartphone and an inclination to do something, and I mean a lot of the YouTube creators who actually are not funded by Net Geo or one of those, but they've yeah. gone to far flung parts of Asia, yeah, and they just recorded their travels there, and then uh, you discover all kinds of stuff. Uh, but it's got that inclination to start. So I think that what you've done is fantastic. Um, just in just on the same kind of vein as uh, Bukit mm-hmm. Basi, right? Um, I was in my beach in Penang, right? Tanjung Munga lah, you know? Okay, yeah. Uh, There's this beach that I call um, uh, Iron Man, um, uh, Ultraman Beach, right? Because uh-huh. the place of Ultraman, kindergarten, right? Whatever. Okay. And there was, a, there was a Spanish guy that actually moved to Penang like six, seven years ago. And um, he, he was walking his dog. And he knew something about Penang that I didn't know. He said, "Oh, you know that this 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 bo- body of water where we can see Gunung Jirai on the other side. Do you know that there were German submarines that used to come through here, Second World no, War? I didn't, I didn't know, know that. that. And actually, there were three submarines that had, been, that had actually been sunk off um off those straits, and they were still in the water below. And I didn't know that. The state government hasn't recognized it till now. I I I, I don't know. Wow. And then he produced yeah. this photo on his phone where there were actually the swastika on the submarine, German officers, and then very clearly behind him, Gurung Jurai, you know. And I'm yeah. from Penang, you know. I yeah. don't know these things. Same for you. You talk about Bukit Basi, right? I didn't know that there were African slaves there. I didn't know that. And we get so caught up in our little like contemporary mm. like domestic squabbles. Yeah. We don't really realize how rich and Edin Kru talks about this, right? Yeah. Malaysia's he she, he used the word bastardized. We are really just <laughs> just roja, you know. We are, we are. That, yeah. And we are more we are more intermixed than we really think we are. We, are. we know we are. But see that's the scary part, right? And I think this is something maybe maybe this is something that the political elite or even Islamists understand, right? So yeah. if it, so the interesting part about most Malay youths that I speak to now is that they feel ashamed of identifying with being Malay. Yeah. And a lot of that is really because of decades of saying, oh, Melayu malas, Melayu accept handouts from government, whatnot, Malay privileges. So for a lot of Malay youths now, they identify more with being Muslim than they do with being Malay. And a lot of that has to do with identifying with the richer, longer history of being Muslim. Lah. The Ottoman Empire, the rise, of, uh, the rise of Islam in Saudi Arabia and how it spreads throughout the, country, uh, throughout the continent, uh, throughout the globe, the world. And there's a sort of pride with being Muslim versus being Malay, and I find that a bit for me like I was I'm a bit disappointed because for me it's like you know, 
Unfortunately, in my twenties, in my early twenties, lah, uh, I did also have a bit of like a bias against my own race, right? Because I felt ashamed. I was told that I should feel ashamed for, uh, because of something that Amnu has done and whatnot. Oh, this reflects on me as a race. But I think as I grew older, there's a realization that I cannot allow other people to speak for my own understanding of race. I need to reclaim what yeah. millennials meant, right? And yeah. then that 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 I think was in part why I was drawn to wanting to explore. The rest of the country, right? Meet other Malays, meet meet other Malaysians, right? To understand, okay, actually, Malayness is there is something to be proud of in Malay history and Malay culture, right? A long, rich history of cosmopolitanism, a long history of traditional understanding of nature, our place in the region as uh, seafarers, uh, and if anyone, if you go to Trengganu, the fact is that the boat builders in Trengganu, right, were renowned. For their boat building skills, nobody really talks about yeah. that. Merong, uh, the movie Merong Wah Mang. I didn't learn yeah. that as a genre. It was, I, uh, and the person who had to re- the person who had to uncover that and document that was a French woman called Pon Rahani Longwet, a French woman who came to Malaysia in Trengganu in her twenties, saw the beauty of Trengganu and the boat builders and spent the rest of her life here. And I'm thinking, like, man, it's always irked me. It's no? always someone else who does the yeah. work. For us. And, and, and rarely yeah. someone from the, you know, yeah. Europe or North America. Yeah. I mean, why do we acknowledge our own merits? Yeah. I, I don't get it. So, and, and I think there's a point I was getting back to, la, which is that I think it is in current political interest to not explore our histories because when we do, we start seeing that actually we are more, we are more intimate. Integrated. We are more integrated <laughs> than we realize. Yeah. Um, Islamists would then try to push the more Global Islamic history because that's a way of sidelining and saying, oh, you're you're connected to a more global Islamic thing. But then what you do by doing that is that you then say that your cultural history is unimportant. Your cultural history, which you know the Malacca Empire grew on, that the Kedahan Empire grew on, is unimportant. Uh, focus on a global ummah. Remove the traditions, um, and then that becomes problematic because now you have youths who know very little about their own. Malaysian history or Malay history, but then are very quite well versed in what happened in Middle East. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't be well versed in global history or Islamic history. I am to an extent, but at the same time, for me, I recognize that you know there is a lot to celebrate in Malaysia in part of history. But why isn't is in political interest yeah. to not yeah. allow that sort of a more complex picture? Because and again, like, this boils down to dialogue, lah. When you start having conversations with each other and discover that actually we have more in common. Then you know that threatens political order, right? Well, perhaps by doing so, it sullies the current narrative, which is conducive and convenient for them. So, yeah. again, I mean, comes back to our leadership lah and the vacuum that exists therein. What's your next project, um, Azif? Because I want to, <laughs> I want to get you want to get to talk about you. There are whatever, whatever. There are multiple be. projects. I mean, if if you're talking about my ongoing project. Now, uh, I, I know you've said that I haven't done my journalistic work for a very long time. A lot of that really no, is out of fans. Yeah. No. But I actually, that's something which I'm still interested in doing. Perhaps, but in a different strain. Lah. Like, I'm still interested in smaller histories of towns, right? So, like, uh, in 2020, I went down to Temuloh because I wanted to know more about uh, its history and its people. So, fantastic, I did record that. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I can share the link with you lah, to read about it. Um, but ongoing is me. I just want to go around the country kind of document small things here and there. But, I mean, if you're talking about big projects, which are a bit more academic in nature, right now it's really about understanding how urban development is linked to our racial ideas, like how we see ourselves as a country. So that, that one's a bit more, uh, that one's a bit more dry, a bit more boring. Um, but yeah, that's what I'm up to right now. If the Prime Minister asks you to join the government, would you join? No, I wouldn't. Why? I, one is, again, I, I do not believe in the whole you can change the system from the outside. Um, but I think there is, there's a certain advantage being from the outside because one, you're not tied to the system. But two, you're able to kind of operate independently and you're able to, I think, allow, you're able to criticize the system in a way that being in the system wouldn't allow you to criticize. Because I mean, again, like, I mean, people that we know who probably entered the system suddenly mm. feel that, mm. man, I'm drawn there are so many things I need to consider as part of my politics, as part of my future that I end up having to play the game. But being on the outside allows you to still, I mean, I'm not saying be a consultant, lah, but it allows me at least to not be an encumbered by, I'm able to kind of express my views, I'm able to kind of see the system a bit more clearly without needing to be a part of it. I would never I would never want to join politics, like that, that much I'm very clear of. Not only do I want to hold you to that statement, I also want to hope 
that people of your generation and of your background will also feel and think the same way. Because if you, if enough of you feel and think the same way, then the ability of the powers that be to compromise your ideals uh, will be lessened. Lah. So I get the feeling that obviously we, down the line, we're going to be talking a little bit more. I hope so. Uh, yeah. And um, I want to thank you for the conversation, your honesty, and I thought it was brilliant. And I'm very optimistic about Malaysia's future if more of uh, Malaysia's youths are like you. Lah. So thank, thank you. you. Yeah, that's high regard. Thank you. All right, mate. Thank you so much. Thanks.